It is Wednesday, August 12th, and we are picking up, I believe it's part three, if I remember right. We are looking at the key players of the tribulation period, and then we're going to take what happens in God's plan of the ages all the way to eternity future as per the, the question and the request. We started at the end of last class on the Antichrist. We saw that the Antichrist is his name. We gleaned that from first Yochanan, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. Uh, we're not going to look that one up today since we did last time on the, the in, in the class, but we saw that that's where Antichrist comes from, and we looked at the meaning is not in place of, it's against. We need to know that clearly because feeling that it's in place of leads many to false ideas, to false doctrine. One of the biggest that it leads them to is they believe that then the Antichrist is Jewish because Christ was Jewish. This is not true. We'll look at that today. But first, let's look at some other names we get for the Antichrist in Scripture because the only time Antichrist is used is in 1 John. So let's find out what his other names are and what other scriptures say about him. Daniel, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8, we have him introduced as the little horn. And uh, we are, sorry, yeah, I am there now. Okay. <clears throat> While I was contemplating the horns, we have, um, we have four horns that were, let's see, what verse do I need to go to to get you started? I'm jumping in the middle. It's, it's really prior, so verse 3 of chapter 7 tells us there were four great beasts coming up from the sea, and it describes them, and then uh, verse 5 is another beast. This beast, uh, all of these are telling us the kingdoms that were before this. We started with Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. We saw Greece represented, and now we're coming down to the point where we are seeing out of Alexander's empire, there were four horns that came up for generals that when he died and his, uh, his uh, kingdom was divided. And we're going to see that there's a little horn that comes up uh, in response to that. And that's what we're getting here in verse 8. I'm looking to see if I need to read 3. Um, I think I can, with what I've said, I can just read verse 8 for us. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, this one possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. From this scripture here, we call him the little horn. We see that we have a type, and then an antitype, a bigger type, a greater type later. Often in scripture, you'll see in prophecy a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment, something that gives us an idea of what it'll be like early, that it's not the full fulfillment of that prophecy, a greater fulfillment will come down the road. And that's what we have here because the four horns, as I said, came out of Alexander the Great's empire. So when his empire was divided up, and then um, you have a, a come up from there, another little horn that uprooted three, took three kingdoms down. Well, what we're looking at is uh, a picture of Antiochus Epiphanes. If I'm saying his name different than you pronounce, that's okay. I don't know the right way for sure. But we are going to see if we kept reading. In fact, we will keep reading. I'm going to pick us up uh, in just a moment in chapter 8. We'll see that he came out of Syria. He came out of one of the areas of Alexander the Great's empire when it was divided. That's why we're seeing that type there. It is very likely that Antiochus Epiphanes is giving us a very good picture then of what the Antichrist will be like. Because we know the Antichrist did not appear back in this time. Alexander the Great was what? I should have my, my history down. Uh, 300 BC approximately, uh, 350 BC, somewhere in there. So we know the Antichrist didn't come on the scene the tribulation end and we'd be into the millennial kingdom. In fact, we'd be past that even by now if that were the case. So obviously this was a near fulfillment, giving us an example, a type, and there'll be a greater fulfillment that will come. Let's look a little more at what this one does and, and we'll understand that as we look at it. So just flip to chapter eight of Daniel, and we're going to look at verses nine through 14. Maybe we'll even pick up at verse eight to get our context. I think we probably will. 
Um, and then we're going to drop down to some other verses in the chapter, so hold on right there, even if we flip away, hold on to chapter 8 for a few moments. Uh, let's look at 8, verse 8. Here we're going to see uh, what leads into that little horn that we just called it the little horn from chapter 7. In 8, we have a male goat that magnified himself exceedingly, but as soon as he was mighty, the large horn was broken. In its place, there came up four conspicuous horns. Here you go comparing now to chapter 7, toward the four winds of heaven. Remember, Alexander's empire was the world at that point, divided by four generals. We're set up with that again. Then out of one of them came forth a rather small horn. We called it a little horn in chapter 7. Uh, the small horn grew exceedingly great toward the south, the east, and toward the beautiful land. The beautiful land is symbolic uh, language for Israel, and I'll agree, it's beautiful. <laughs> okay, it grew up to the host of heaven. It grew up as, as, as far as, as you would see the heavens. It caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth, and it trampled them down. Now, we know that this is symbolic language. We see in it what could be a, a reflection of what Satan did when he... Uh, brought the angels who followed him down when he uh, wanted to be worshipped like God. And in essence, he was cast out of heaven. We know he's not bound to the earth yet, but he lost his preeminent position with the Lord because of that sin of pride, because of wanting to dethrone God. And he caused some of the angels to fall with him because they followed him to be their leader. But again, we're looking to... Uh, the heavens, what happened there to see on the earth, but I believe the point here is this again is backed by Satan. That Satan is the one that gave the power to this little horn to cause such a, a upset that we're going to see. It even magnified itself, this little horn, to be equal with the commander of the host. Does that not sound like Satan, Satan, when he tried to be like God, the commander? But we know here it's this little one that was Antiochus Epiphanes who tried to take over not only the empire uh, or the, the quarter of the empire that he had, which was the Syrian area, but he wanted world control also. And he also, coincidentally enough, looked at himself as God and wanted to be worshipped as God, and that's even partly what his name was meaning. Um, if I remember right, the Israelis called him Epiphanes, which changed it from being a little god to being a madman. So they did a play on his name because he was a madman. He removed the regular sacrifice from him. Now we know we're looking to the future because we know this is what the Antichrist will do. He's going to stop the sacrifices that will be taking place in the temple, and he's going to put himself there to be worshipped. And that's what he did. The place of the sanctuary was thrown down. On account of the transgression, the host will be given over to the horn, along with the regular sacrifice. It will fling truth to the ground and perform its will. Keep that in mind. We're going to pick up that name in a bit. And prosper. Um, is that where I want to stop, or do I want to go a little further? I'll go just a little further. Then I heard a holy one speaking. Another holy one said to that particular one who was speaking, how long will the vision about the regular sacrifice apply? While the transgression causes horror, so as to allow both the holy place and the host to be trampled. In this case, the host would be Jerusalem because the holy place is in, in, in the temple in Jerusalem. What we're seeing here is a reference to all of this to how the Antichrist seizes control of the temple, wants the worship to come to him. He causes the temple to, to become desolate. We read that in Daniel 9 before, and we'll be touching on that shortly. Truth is, is flung to the ground like it is, it's being trampled on is the idea there. And his will prospering. So how long is all this horror going to happen? How long will the holy place be trampled underfoot? How long will Jerusalem be trampled? And we know in Revelation it said that Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot. And in Revelation it said it would be for three and a half years. Well, verse 14 says here, he said to me for 2,300, 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the holy place will be properly restored. Well, 2,300 evenings and mornings just happen to be three and a half years or 42 months. So we have the same language speaking, and that's why we know we've started with Antiochus Epiphanes, but we see it's going all the way foreshadowing what the Antichrist will do. So here we see that he is called the little one. Let me show you, um, well, let me take you to Isaiah 
Um, remember, we're going to come back to Daniel 9 shortly. But right now, go to Isaiah 14. Yeshia chapter 14. And I will um, explain something there. We're going to read verses 24 to 27. Isaiah 24, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14, 24 to 27. And here we're reading about the judgment that God's sending on Assyria. Remember the ten northern tribes went into captivity for their idolatry and their disobedience. And they were taken into captivity by Assyria. Later the two southern tribes are taken into captivity for the very same reason. And it happens by Babylon. Babylon had swallowed up Assyria by that point. So all twelve tribes are under one roof, quote, so to speak under captivity in Babylon when we have Daniel and other um, like scriptures. But here we're t doing a little prior to that, we're doing the time when Assyria has taken the ten northern uh, tribes into captivity. Verse 24 says, the Lord of hosts. Now, that's the true Lord. This is not the one who's trying to, to disturb the hosts of heaven. This is our Lord, Jehovah. Or, or here would be um, Adonai Sava'ot, the Lord of the heavens, the Lord of the hosts, has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I have intended, so it has happened. I love that. Stop and think before we move on. Just as God intended, it happened. Never is God's plan disturbed. Never does something come in to interfere. Not a pandemic, not a, a disease, not a kingdom, not a false God who tries to say he's God. His plan goes forward. Just as he intended it has happened, and just as I planned, so it will stand. Verse 24. So what's going to stand, what's going to happen? Verse 25, to break Assyria in my land. Now, where does God call his land? Doesn't he own it all? Isn't it all his? It's all his. He created everything. But when he specifies and says, my land, we know that he chose to put his name in one place geographically. And that was in Yerushalayim, comma, Israel. So he's talking that he's going to break Assyria when Assyria is controlling Israel. And that's what's happening right now. Or in our, at, at our time, that was what was happening. I don't mean today, I mean in the scripture we're reading. And I will trample him. That enemy is going to be trampled on my mountains. So this enemy is going to be destroyed in Israel on the mountains of Israel. Then his yoke will be removed from them. The yoke that he's put in Israel, God's people under, will be removed and a burden removed from their shoulder. This is the plan devised against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out against all the nations. Okay, did we just go to a bigger picture? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Once again, we're seeing a type and an answer type. A, a near fulfillment and a greater fulfillment. So where we know Assyria was taken down by God allowing Babylon to conquer Assyria, now we're seeing a time when the whole earth has come against Israel and we see that, that God's going to stretch forth his hand against all the nations. Remember, he said if he didn't stop the war of the battle of Armageddon, there'd be no flesh left alive. We know the whole world is coming into play at that time. Mm -hmm. The Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? Mm -hmm. And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? Mm -hmm. God is in control. So Assyria would be destroyed in, in Israel. It happened. The Antichrist will be brought to an end in Israel. It will happen. Because of the, the picture that we're being given, the question is asked, does this indicate to us that the Antichrist would be Assyria? If so, the area of Assyria that we're talking about is what we call Syria today, and a greater part. Takes in part of Iraq, Iran, I think it takes in all of Iraq, I'm sorry, part of Iran, but in that area. Now, we cannot go out on the limb and say, absolutely, that's the territory where the Antichrist will come from, but it seems highly likely that God would have been using that picture in this area, and this will stir up again. So that's why a lot of us believe that the Antichrist will come out of the area, either Surat, Surat, 
I'm having trouble with my words today. Syria, Iraq, Iran, you know, the related areas there. And I find it very interesting that who is at war with Israel today? Syria, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon, you know, all of this is very uh, explosive. There's another word I want, but it's volatile, very volatile. It wants to explode. We see trouble brewing constantly. If someone in that area, and I'll prove my point of Arab descent in, in a bit, but if someone of Arab descent came up from that area, caused that whole area to settle down and make peace with Israel, I would say we've got ourselves what Daniel 9 has described. Mm -hmm. I look for it to come from that area. I don't look necessarily for us to see it. I know we will not see the Antichrist revealed, but that does not mean that he's not at work today. If we are as close as I believe we are, as I said last week, then I don't believe that he's not been born yet. I believe he's been born. I don't believe he's a little child. I believe he's an adult, and I believe he's in the political world, and I believe that's as far as we're going to know, according to Second Thessalonians. We'll get to that in time, too. But uh, I just find it very interesting that that is an area today that uh, Israel really needs peace with and continually says... I do not have a peace partner. So, just food for thought. We'll come back to it more. But this is our little horn. This is the one that Antiochus Epiphanes is a type of. Now, on our way back to, well, actually, we're going back to Daniel right now. Let's go back to chapter 8. If you kept your uh, finger there, you can just flip back. We're looking at verse 23 now. We're going to get another name. And these names give us the characteristics of the Antichrist. From this, we know that, that he uh, dissolved three other kingdoms. We know that he wanted his will and his way. We're going to see the force that he puts into it. Because again, even though he comes on as a man of peace, it's not long before he shows he's not about peace at all. In Daniel, Daniel chapter 8, verse 23, we read, In the latter period of their rule, when the transgressors have run their course, a king will arise insolent, skilled in intrigue, espionage. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He will destroy to an extraordinary degree and prosper and perform his will. He will destroy mighty men and the holy people, and through his shrewdness, he will cause deceit to succeed by his influence. So he's going to be very shrewd. He's going to destroy great men. He's going to destroy Believers, they are the ones who are holy people. What makes you holy? Faith in Yeshua, in Yeshua Jesus. I don't mean just Jewish believers, Jewish and Gentile believers. He's shrewd. He causes deceit by his influence. He will magnify himself in his heart. Oh, is his heart with death. He will destroy many that are at ease. Remember, he makes a false peace treaty. So they think they're safe. They think, oh, he wouldn't do this. And then he's going to show who he really is. He will even oppose the prince of princes. That would be our Lord. But he will be broken without human agency. Who's going to take him down? Nobody human. We know it's the Lord he himself at the battle of Armageddon that will take him down. Um, and then it goes on and it gives the, the timing here, but we've already covered that. So out of this, this one was called, and it, it's apparently in the King James, and I read to you in the um, New American without realizing it doesn't match. But what they call him from this description is the king of fierce countenance. That he has a fierce countenance. He, he is fierce in, his, in what he is doing. He is performing his will. We're going to see the will brought in again, as I mentioned just a moment ago. But had I read it to you in King James, and I'm looking for where it would have been, and I didn't realize I'd switched on myself. Uh, but you'll hear that name, King of Fierce Countenance, and they take it from the Old English, uh, because verse 23 says a king will arise insolent and skilled in intrigue. That's where in your King James it will call Fierce Countenance. There's your King of Fierce Countenance. So let's go to another name we're a little more familiar with in chapter 9 of Daniel. Remember, Daniel and Revelation are our two biggest prophecy uh, revealers of the last days. Daniel 9, we're not going to look at all 24 to 27. We're going to just read right now in relation to the Antichrist. So we're going to read chapter, I'm sorry, verse 26 and verse 27. 
In 26, we have that after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off in our study, real recent study, Daniel 9. We saw that was his crucifixion. He would be cut off. He'd have nothing. The people, the prince who is to come, notice that's not the prince of princes. This is the prince who is to come, uh, will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary in this day when Messiah was cut off was Rome. So we know that it was the Roman prince that would come. And we know that, that he would destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And that's what Titus did. He even um, melted down the walls to get the gold in between the bricks. So he left nothing in turn. He dissolved as much of Jerusalem as it could, destroyed the holy temple and all that was in it. So we know that this is uh, uh, the one that we are talking about. And many think because of this, that the Antichrist has to be, come from Rome because he was a Roman prince because he was from Rome at that time. But remember, we saw already that the one who is, was most like the Antichrist came out of the Syrian area, Assyria. That, that is the example that's being set. When we talk about a Roman prince, they take that to Rome and they go to, and if I'm offending anyone, I mean no offense, I'm just teaching what's out there. They will teach that that's Roman Catholicism, that the Pope is now the Antichrist. They get that from this because it says that, they, that he would be the, the prince um, of the people who were to come who would destroy the city and the sanctuary. But it's not the Pope. The Pope does not fit any of the other criteria for the Antichrist. He doesn't fit the names. He doesn't fit the characteristics. He is not at war with Israel in a way to make a peace treaty with Israel. Granted, the Vatican has not shown itself to be a favor and a friend of Israel overall, but there's not a war, and it would mean nothing except a compromise on the part of Judaism to have Roman Catholicism and Judaism run hand in hand. That's not the picture that we see for the Antichrist. We know also that the Antichrist is going to want the worship himself. Well, we know that the Pope is already, uh, by those who are of Roman Catholicism, that the Pope himself already is seen as God, so it's not something that Satan is fighting for there. He's got that victory mm -hmm. in that sense, so it just does not fit. But when it's talking about this area, when we keep it in the context, when he, this prince was from the people, the prince who destroys the city and the sanctuary, we are talking about the, re, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was very large at that time, it had uh, 10 major countries in it. It had others in it also. So what we are seeing from this, when we look at Don, Daniel's uh, image and his statue, we know we've gone from the head, Nebuchadnezzar, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Now we're going to go to the revived Roman Empire, to the ten toes. Now when we hear things about ten horns, ten toes, everything is falling into place. So... What this is telling us is not that he's going to come from Rome and be the, the Vatican or be the uh, Pope, but we know he's going to come from the revived Roman Empire, the old Roman Empire. And again, he is putting himself up as a king, king of fierce countenance. This, is, this would be juxtaposed to the Pope. It's not that it's one and the same. They just do not fit. So even though he's called a Roman prince, don't read that, that he's Rome, he's the Pope, he's the Vatican. It just, it doesn't work, okay? Let's look at Daniel chapter 11 now, because that will give us um, some more hints. Here he's called, the, hint, the name I've hinted at several times, he is called the Willful King. We're going to read Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, and we're going to read um, verses 36 to 39. And right away we have why he's called the willful king. The first words that I read or the first phrase is, then the king will do as he pleases. So he's a willful king. He's doing his own will. And didn't we see that in the chapters eight, 7 and 8 preceding? He is acting as a dictator. He has his own self-will. He is even going to exalt himself above God. Okay, we will see that shortly. Um, let me back us up to verse 30 for just a moment, which is also still talking about this willful king. It says in verse 30, 
The ships of Kedem will come against him. Therefore, he'll be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the Holy Covenant and take action. So he will come back and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Okay, what we're seeing again is he's working his will. And in that, we see that um, when, he, when some of the countries come against him, he becomes so enraged, he takes it out on the Holy Covenant. He takes it out on Israel. He takes it out on God's people. And he's showing um, that he, he has no regard for the, the ways of Judaism, no regard for the ways of Christianity, because those are part of the Holy Covenant that he is opposed to. Now let's go back to verse, actually before we go to 36, we'll go back to 36, keep your finger there, but take a short trip with me for any who have not been through this before. Let me take you quickly to 2 Thessalonians. But as I said, we'll come back to Daniel, so don't lose it. 2 Thessalonians, we want to look at chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, and we're going to look at just verses 3 and 4 right now. We'll look probably at more a little later. Here is where we see him exalt himself above God. What we read it in Daniel 11, that he was going to exalt himself above God. 2 Thessalonians backs it up. Verse 3 of chapter 2, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, and his time of the Antichrist, will not come unless the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Right there, even though I can build on far more than one verse for my uh, prophetic view, I see in this that there, there are certain things that happen before the man of lawlessness is revealed. That apostasy people take to today and they say an apostasy is falling away from the truth. That's true in our day. And we know that for quite a while there has been an apostasy going on. We know that right now the Church of Philadelphia, the on fire for the Lord, serving the Lord, putting out missionaries, trying to reach people with the gospel, is alive and well. But we know there's another church on the face of this earth that is also alive and well, and that is the Church of Laodicea. And it's, I shouldn't say it's well because it's not. It's so sick, but it doesn't know it's sick. It's, it's blind, it doesn't know it can't see. It's naked, it doesn't know it's naked all the way through the description it thinks it's wonderful and it's in great trouble well with that in mind knowing that that is going on continually how would you know about an apostasy that comes first there's been apostasy going on for a long time but if we take this word and we go back into the time that it was written and we notice that in and we look to greek when we look at new testament books for the original uh, how it was written we see that there's a key little word in front of apostasy. In our English, we throw it out. In speed reading, you're taught not to even notice it. But in Greek, it's important. It says the apostasy would come first. As soon as it put that word the in there, it took it away from being any apostasy. It's now a specific apostasy. If I ask you to bring me a cup, you can bring any cup you want. But if I ask you to bring me the cup, then you know I'm looking for a specific. When God's talking about this apostasy, he's talking about a specific apostasy. Again, how would we recognize it when apostasy is going on? But if we keep it in its context, we keep it in what the word meant in its day. The word is a, a falling away, but it's also a snatching away, a catching away, it's pulling something away. Now, if I take you to the story in Acts, I want to say 7 or 9, the, the Ethiopian eunuch, you can find it easily. It's 9. I believe it's 9. If I took you to that chapter, and you, if you know the story, Philip is told he needs to evangelize. This man in this chariot was reading Yeshia, Isaiah 53. He could not understand it. God sends Philip in, Philip explains it to him, rides in his chariot with him, explains it to him, he accepts, he believes, they're near water, he's baptized, and as soon as that's over, Philip was suddenly found in Azotus, a city of some distance away. He was snatched away, he was apostatized, he was caught away. The same root word in the Greek that we have here. 
So when we see it in that context, then we're looking for a great snatching away, a great catching away. Now, when it happened to Philip, it happened by the hand of God, and it was not a bad thing that happened. God picked him up, put him down where he wanted to use him. When the Lord comes for his body, his bride, his believers, he is going to snatch us away. He is going to catch us away. The word rapture comes out of our rapturo, Latin in the 15th century. The teaching goes all the way back to the first century, the beginning of the church. We have Sha'ol Paul give it to the first round of believers in the first churches that he was um, founding, that he gave birth to. And we have him talking about a snatching way, a catching way. If we look just back to the first letter he wrote to Thessalonians, he wrote in chapter 4 extensively of that day. He didn't call it the rapture, but he called it the great snatching away, or the great catching away. The root word in the Greek, again, is the same root word. When you remember, these books were not chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 5. When you write a letter to a friend, you write in paragraphs, but you don't put chapter 1 unless you're writing a book. Well, Shaul Paul didn't know it was going to become a book. He's writing a letter. He's writing a letter to people he knows. And so he wrote in paragraphs. The first letter he wrote and sent to Thessalonians we call 1 Thessalonians. And in chapter 4, he extensively tells them about this snatching away, what's coming, and that the, the believers, well, what's happened is they're at the gravesite of dear loved ones, and they're crying, they are hurting, they think that these people have died and missed it all, and he brings to the people that they have not missed it all, that they are with Messiah, with Christ, even now, and then we who are alive and remain will also be caught up together, meet the Lord in the air, and that caught up is a snatching away, and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we always be with the Lord. So he's just written that to him in chapter 4. Chapter 5, he gives him some closing remarks, greet so-and-so, da-da-da, and says his shalom, goodbye, okay? Now he's starting a second letter to them. The reason for that second letter we could find at the start of, uh, of chapter 2 right here. So let me take you back to that real quickly. In verse 1, we see that Shaul Paul is requesting to the believers. He calls them brethren, believers with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, okay? Has he talked to them about the coming of the Lord? Yes. Chapter 4, we called it, toward the end of his first letter. And our gathering together to him. Did he talk about the, our gathering together to him in, in chapter 4 of the first letter? Yes, he did. I just gave that to you. I'm trying to save time, so read First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 on your own and you'll see it backs up what I'm saying. So Paul obviously in verse one is saying, hey, remember the letter that I wrote to you? I told you about the coming of the Lord. I told you about our gathering together and here's his reason for writing the second letter. That you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed by either a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. What happened? Dear Thessalonians got word to Paul that they were shook to the core. They lost their composure. They were scared. What do I want to say? Spitless? <laughs> they were shaking. Why? Apparently somebody sent them a letter and signed Paul's name to it and told them, you missed the boat. You're now in what we call the tribulation period you are in deep yogurt. The day of the Lord is here, and you're going to have to live through all this. They remember that Paul told them there was this great catching away, and they've missed it. So they're shook, and they don't understand. And Paul's saying, whoa, wait a minute. Don't be shook. Don't be upset. Don't be scared. I didn't write that letter to you. I didn't tell you the day of the Lord has come. Don't let any man deceive you. Verse 3. It will not come until the apostasy, until the snatching away comes first. Now, Shaul Paul did not talk to them 
about a, a time when people would leave the church because they're falling away from the Lord. He didn't talk about that in, in the first letter. He talked about being snatched away in, in what we call chapter 4. So keeping in context, just like you would. If you wrote a letter to a friend and you wanted to write more information later, you would build on what you had written. You wouldn't go back and re-say it. You'd say, hey, remember? Well, that's what he did, remember. And so here it makes it very clear that he is going on with his second letter to them, telling them, you don't have to worry about it. This is what's going to happen, okay? That snatching away will not come until, I mean, that snatching away is the possibility, okay? That comes first. The snatching away comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Man of lawlessness is another name for our antichrist. We'll, we'll be seeing that. So when is he revealed? After the snatching away. That's why I say he can be in our world today. He can be behind the scenes. He can be even in the front of the scenes right now if we're right on the edge we think we're in, but we are not aware of who he is. We can't point a finger and say, aha, he's the antichrist. We might have a good clue, and we might have no clue at all. I'll give you a time in uh, history, not that long ago, my mom's era. Um, Nasser was head of Egypt. Nasser hated Israel. The border between Egypt and Israel was more than hot. It was deadly in Nasser's era, with Nasser in control. Behind Nasser, his right-hand man was Sadat. Everybody thought Sadat was in Nasser's back pocket, just, just followed Nasser, and whatever Nasser did, he helped him do it, and he was great with it. Nasser gets removed from the picture, Sadat steps into place, and one of the first things Sadat does is make a peace treaty with Israel. He was a man with his own mind and his own thoughts and his own ways. Now, he was not the Antichrist. This happened in the 70s, I think, maybe even the early, earlier than that, maybe 60s, 1900. <laughs> I have to remember we're in 20th century. So he, I'm not pointing him out saying he was the Antichrist, but I think that's a good picture for us. There could be somebody right behind the scenes that we don't think has a, a mind of their own, doesn't pull any political weight, and yet all of a sudden he gets put in a position and he flies and he makes a peace treaty with Israel because he has an ulterior motive. He's not making a peace treaty with Israel, the Antichrist, because he likes Israel, because he, he really wants to bring peace. He wants to bring a false peace. He intends from the very beginning, build your temple, but it's going to be for me. He just leaves that part out. Build your temple, Israel. Have at it. We want you to live in peace. I'll, I'll secure your borders so you can build your temple, you can do your sacrifices, you can do all the worshiping, and the whole time he's thinking, I'm going to let you spend your money, your labor, your effort, and then I'm going to come in and snatch it. When the, when the diamond's been brought out of that rough, been polished up, looks great, that's when I'm going to snatch it for myself. He isn't ever a friend of Israel. He is a false friend. So he will come after... Mm -hmm the snatching away. The son of destruction is also what he's called, and it tells in verse 4 how he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so he takes a seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And then Paul says it again, do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? See, he's drawing on that picture, and so he's reminding them, you have no worry, this happens after you're gone. Now, will we see the temple being rebuilt? We could. It doesn't say that the temple won't be rebuilt till we're gone. It just simply says that he won't take control of the temple till we're gone. So, which side of the rapture the temple is built on, I can't tell you. All I can tell you is if you see it being built, don't panic. You're not in the tribulation. You're not in the last days. It can happen or start to happen before we go home, or it could happen after the rapture. Real short side note, but because this is what we're on, let me give you pearl theory. Hear those two words? <laughs> pearl theory. In other words, I cannot give you a Bible verse and say, thus saith the Lord. If I could, 
I tell you, take it to the bank, write your check on it, cash it, and go live on that money, okay? But here's what I can easily see happening in my little pea brain, okay? P for pearl, pea brain, okay? <laughs> we do believe, and I have good reason to believe, that the Jewish people, Israelis, know where the Ark of the Covenant is that belongs in the Holy of Holies. I have a dear friend who is a personal friend of the chief rabbi of the wall in Israel, which Terry and I happened to get to see recently together. Well, not together, but within a short time. We both got to go to the wall. This rabbi controls the area there, and he has been a longtime friend of my friend who is a believer. The rabbi is not. I'm sorry, my friend is. The rabbi is a great believer in God, but we're praying he'll come to know his Messiah. When my friend, who is a highly respected person, is speaking to this highly respected chief rabbi and asked him, I hear you found the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. you know, and he hinted, I don't think you're free to say, but I'm hearing this. He said, my rabbi friend looked at me, smiled ear to ear, and didn't say a word. Okay? Mm -hmm. We're all reading between the lines. Mm -hmm. I believe that rabbi knows. I believe that he's not the only one who knows, but I believe that they have discovered it and have not been able to do anything about it because they are dealing with Arab control of this area. Mm -hmm. The Temple Mount is in Arab control hands. Mm -hmm. Right now it's so volatile that when the Temple Mount faithful people try to lay the cornerstone to build the temple, it explodes into rioting, and the police tell the, the Israelis, put the, the um, cornerstone back. It's... You can't do this yet. The Temple Mount does not want an Israeli on that mountain worshiping their God. They try to stop any Israeli from even wearing their kippah on the mount. Do I think this is right? No. Does it make my Jewish blood boil that a Jew in Israel, the only place safe to be a Jew on the face of this earth because it's their land, should be able to wear their kippah and worship their God? Yes, I believe they should. And it's the great controversy in Israel that has Israelis pitted at each other. But Moshe Dayan gave control of the Temple Mount to the Arab people in 67 when Jerusalem was reunited because of the two mosques that were on the Temple Mount. They wanted to respect the other people's religion. So they said, we'll leave you control, and that's where it is right now. So, if they even have their ark, we do know they have everything they need for the temple rebuilt already. If, did you visit the Temple Treasure Institute? Yeah. And, and Melly did before, and I got to go. Rowena and I left Rowena and Rudy out. They were with me. We went to the wall together, did we not? <laughs> so, yes, yeah, sorry, folks. And I left Tony out of the Philippines last week. I, I, I spin too fast. <laughs> anyway, a Philippine mission trip. Anyway, um, and I've derailed my thought. Okay, we're at the, the oh, we're at the Temple Treasure Institute. We are told very explicitly and very clearly, and I have eyewitnesses to back me up, that these are not museum pieces. These are the actual pieces that will go into the temple to be used in temple worship as soon as they can build their temple. That the institute will empty out, everything will go in the temple, and it will go into place. We know that the reports are out that they are training the Kohanim to be the priests. They know how to do the work that they have to do. Everything is set. Everything is in motion. Um, Sidetrack, there is discussion again about the red heifer. To my knowledge, we're still in the waiting period. A red heifer has to be found for the high priest to be able to start his priestly duties again. They are watching, too, is what the last I heard that the, these heifers, they have to watch them for between two and five years, two years minimum. If they're found with one white hair anywhere, they're disqualified. Years ago, they thought they had the red heifer. They got one white hair in the tail, and it was disqualified. But there is discussion going again. There is a beautiful um, study of the red heifer, who, what the red heifer represents of our Messiah, and uh, I was asked last week to bring that as a teaching, so I'm looking after we get done with eternity future, do you want the red heifer in relation to the Messiah? Thumbs up, thumbs down, neutral. 
Yeah. I'm looking yeah. at all you now. Okay. Okay. Then that's what we'll follow. We know after we get to eternity future when we're pulled back into this reality, <laughs> then we'll talk about the red half. Or it'd be a one class. But I believe it's, to me, it's a very, very rich um, um, study. Um, a lot like what we get out of the Passover. A very rich study. So if you haven't heard, I think you'll enjoy it. So back on track. If they're that ready, everything's that ready, we're just waiting for the okay to be able to do it and not have it cause war up there on that mountaintop. Let's have the rapture happen. We just disappeared. There's chaos all over in this world when we disappear. We know that. I mean, you can't help but know it. People disappear. There's going to be all kinds. New Age already has the, the plan out there that when we believers disappear, they're telling people, oh, don't worry. They've not been harmed. They've been simply removed, taken away to where they're being, their minds are being allowed, I'll use the word reprogram, but their minds are being allowed to be brought into hmm, harmony. And when they're not the, the, the ones against peace, but the ones who will help with peace, then they'll be brought back. So no worries. That's already out there. Satan's already got an answer for the rapture. And there's more like that going on. Again, and another Hitler reason why I Jewish think people. what Hitler tried to do to the Jewish yeah. people. Yes, yes, same, same sort of lie. So we have disappeared. They're trying to grasp hold. They're trying to figure things out. Things are volatile in the, the Near East. And this man who is fierce, who's the little horn, who's working his will, we will see, does come on with charisma. We'll talk about that in just a little bit in Daniel 11. Um, he's going to come on at first looking like he's great. If he's able to bring Israel and the Arab countries together on the same page to sit down and really talk, Israel's been saying they don't have a partner for peace. He says, I'm your partner, and he, he seems to mean it. We know, hey, that could move forward quickly. Now, here's my theory part again. If they bring out the ark about the same time, they're able because now the Arab and the Jew are getting along and they're able to pull it out because I believe it's hidden on that Temple Mount area deep in the recesses. I believe we may have walked right past it. You know, it gives me chills. Anyway, back on. Um, if they bring it out and the Antichrist says, you know what, Israel? You've got your ark. That's your most holy um, in instrument, whatever I should call it. Build your temple. You should have the right. Remember, we're making peace with you. Build your temple. Put your ark in there. Do your worshiping. And in the back of his mind, he's, <laughs> and it'll all be mine. <laughs> Do we not see how easily it could slide into work today? That's why, again, I'm giving you theory, but that's how real it is, how practical I can see in our world today that it is ready, that it is just wanting to explode. And as my mom used to say, you don't set a stage if you're not going to put the act on. So God, pull up the curtain and let's go. <laughs> so um, there is my theory for you, do whatever you want with it, you can throw it out the window because again in this class we don't ever say, well Rachel says <laughs> we say, the Lord says, and here's where the Lord says it okay, so back to, yes, amen question. <laughs> question the red heifer, just a quick one that you, know, you were saying the red heifer, something's yeah. going on in my mind with Jacob and Laban where he was able to breed a program of just, let's say, red, seeing red all the time and having red because he's, he did um, peel off the pole. Black pole, black spots. And, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, the spotted, spotted she, freckled, freckled and speckled. Freckled, speckled. <laughs> all those, I yes. Guess the solid. Right. So right. it just came to me. Right. What she's and asking then, about is could the red heifer be developed the same way that God enabled Yaakov, Jacob, when he worked for Levon, every time Levon, you know, wanted, okay, I get all the, the, the good, the solid colors, you get all the blemished ones. And Jacob agreed, Yaakov agreed. And then it would switch when Laban saw they were more than he wanted those, and he'd take those, and then God would bless Jacob over here. It could be, when God wants a red heifer, there'll be a red heifer. I'll have no doubt, however it happens, I have no doubt. 
about the pearl theory. I was just thinking um, the Jews keep committing the same mistake because in the Old Testament, the kings were showing off the treasures to a potential enemy. And what happens? The enemy really grabs the whole kingdom and all the treasures. And remember that Ark of the Covenant is gold. Literally, I don't mean yeah. I'm calling it gold, it's made out of gold, mm -hmm. you know, gold overlay at least, you know, so, yes, yes, I, I have a question, can you distinguish the um, apostis, apost apostasia, apostasia, that's the word in the Greek, to uh, Haparzo, because I thought they both got away, so what's they, the difference here, because one says Haparzo in mm -hmm. Greece and the other one is saying yeah, they're very similar in their in their meaning. Okay. Um, yeah, harpazo is. In fact, I think I stand corrected. First Thessalonians four is harpazo. Mm -hmm. the, the Acts and uh, where I took you, Second, Second Thessalonians, Second. is yes. apostasia. But the apostasia does mean the, the snatching away, the catching away, and harpazo is a snatching away or catching away. So their meaning is very similar. So with Philip, he used. He is apostasy. apostasy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Because again, Philip was not the actual rapture. Right. See, so the actual rapture uses the word harpazo, but the similar meaning we see used in his context in both places in, in the voice. same. Yes. Yeah. I'm wondering if I'm getting word. Nope. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Still waiting for all the details on the new little one. But anyway. Um, yeah, good question. I'm glad you helped me correct that because I want to be accurate. Um, but again, and I'd have to look up that um, the the one apostasia is something like 15 times in the new um, covenant. And oh, I should I should I didn't realize that's going to go off in it, but so many times it is literally the snatching away, like what we see of Philip. You know that um, I'll I'll bring those. Statistics to us next week and give give you a little breakdown on it. Let me make a quick note on that. Yes. The you gave me a, a lesson before on the harpazo and the apostasia. Do you remember the better? The harpazo is the snatching away, and the apostasia, the original meaning is the departure. So it's just like the same. Something is getting away. Yeah, Thank you. Course. Course. Thank you. You know what? Departure. I'm too rusty, and you are right on target. Yes. The snatching away, yes, is harpazo, and the departure, I remember as soon as she says it, is apostasia. So that's why they're different words, but what is the departure if it is not us being caught away, us being snatched mm -hmm. away? So yeah, thank you so much. Good for you. Good for you. Good student. Good student. I made my home back. <laughs> okay. I'm glad we got that out. Let's go ahead and go back to our willful king and Daniel, Daniel, because I think I've given you everything I wanted. You know what? Just before we go back there, because I like to back things up with scripture, go first to Revelation 13 with me. Revelation 13, we're going to look at verses 12 through 15, but especially verse 12. Chapter 13, while you're getting there, has two beasts. The first one comes up out of the sea. The second one comes up out of the land. Remember, we're dealing with symbolic language. When we look at the language in Scripture, the sea, and I'll give you these verses in just a bit because I'm out of order in my notes and I've got a whole list of verses for you, but the sea talks about the Gentile nations. They're like the seas, the S-E-A-S, okay? And the land always refers to the land called Israel. So the beast out of the land is one that comes out of Israel, one that is Jewish. The beast that comes out of the sea is when it's Gentile, comes out of the Gentile nations. We've got these two beasts introduced to us in chapter 13. I think we will talk more about them later. I think I've probably said enough now. So we have the beast that comes up out of the earth or out of the land in verse 11. That's the one we're going to talk about. So this one is in relation to Israel. This one is not the Antichrist. This one is the false prophet. Okay, and because I want to make sure that we're really clear, I'm going to tell you now. And I'll prove my points. But the Antichrist, I believe, is Gentile. No, he's Gentile. He comes out of Syria or, you know, the Assyrian Empire area. He makes a false peace treaty with Israel. Who's at war with Israel? Is a Jew at war with a Jew? No. 
But is an Arab at war with, with a Jew? Yes. So here's how he brings the two together. Now the false prophet comes up out of the land. The false prophet comes up from Israel. The false prophet fits his name well because where were the prophets? The prophets were in Israel. The prophets were Jewish. The false prophet will be Jewish. He will encourage his Jewish people, hey, you can trust this Arab. You know, I, we know we've been teaching you for years that the Arabs lie and that that's acceptable in their culture. A lie does not mean anything bad. If you need to lie for the, your, the end to your means, then you lie for the end to your means. That's okay. But I, I've gotten to know this one. This one's different politically. This one really is a peace partner. Can you help me? Thank you. Sorry, folks. This is what happens when you Zoom from a living room. I know. You tried. You tried. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, so this one is going to help Israel go along with this Arab. Now, is Israel going to listen to another Arab say you can trust this Arab? No. Why would they? But if it's one of their own that's saying, hey, you can trust this one then they're going to let down their guard and they're going to trust that one. So here's how the two work hand in hand together. False prophet and antichrist. One Gentile, one Jewish. But everybody jumps to that, oh, he's like a Messiah. No, he's not. He doesn't come on like the Messiah. He comes on peaceful with a false peace. But he also comes off very strong and leads them into war, which leads to famine, pestilence and death in the first three and a half years. The idea that your first three and a half years are a picnic and then it gets bad, throw that out. The first three and a half years are bad. The last three and a half years are horrific. Yes, there's a change. Yes, it gets far worse, but it's never good. Only the only quote good is that false peace tree that looks good. But you're going to see the Antichrist in that first three and a half years setting up control for himself in every way. We begin to see a picture of this now. And I'm not here to turn it political. I'm not here to, to go off on anybody or anything but our world conditions today. We can see revelation happening so much easier because of 2020. I did say, jokingly, that maybe we were going to get 2020 vision in 2020. Well, I think we are getting a sharper, our binoculars are being you know, brought in where we're beginning to see without blur. For the first time, we're dealing with a world pandemic. We don't know a world crisis before this. We know areas. Uh, the World War II was an area. World War I was an area. The Black Plague was an area. Whatever catastrophe you think to name, it was an area. Now we're dealing with something, as someone said to me recently, when it started in China, I never thought in a million years it would come to America and then do the damage it's doing in America. That's unheard of. China lets a bug out that gets to the U.S. citizens to the point that the U.S. citizens are right now banned from Europe, banned from Australia, and banned from other countries. Our freedoms are disappearing. We have to think world. You're being told to wear a mask. Your reason for wearing the mask, they don't tell you, is just to protect you. What reason are they pushing? What do you hear constantly? Slow the spread. Protect the others. Think about your fellow people. We need to think as one. We need to go along as one. We need to give our power to one. It's just a small conditioning. Exactly. Terry, you got it perfect. It's just a small step to turn that over to a leader who is showing tough but fair. Something that looks so good. Smells good. The steak is sizzling. But when you cut into it, you find out it's liver. Yeah. <laughs> this is what we're being set up for. This is what we're being to think, beginning to think. One world religion. Yeah. How on earth would that happen? Oh, hello. Do we not see that? Who are the only ones that are pulling it back right now? 
the believing church says, uh-uh, I'm not going along with all the other and Amen. calling it good. But you take us out in rapture, boom, you've got one world religion under one leader, no problem. You've got the false prophet rising up in Israel, giving Israel security. You've got the false Arab coming up, working with this one. Boom. We've got it. We can see it. So for the very first time, we are really seeing and understanding in a way we never did before. And when we take that in, then we realize how very close we must be. And we just pray, Lord, use us all the more to get more saved, to go in the great snatching away, the great catching away that's coming. So here's our false prophet. Here's the one that comes up out of Israel. He has two horns like a lamb. When did you ever see a lamb with <laughs> horns? So what's it telling us? A lamb is tall, sweet, docile, gentle, cuddly. The horns are power and authority, and that's what we've got. We've got a false prophet, one who looks good, but who's not what he looks like. And furthermore, he spoke as a dragon. Who's the dragon in Revelation? Do you remember Revelation 12, 9? We only have to go back one chapter. Go back with me if you want. And what, what are you saying? Satan, 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 yes. 12, 9. The great dragon was thrown down out of heaven. The serpent of old. Who's the serpent of old? Well, if you don't, if you're still wondering, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world? He's thrown down to the earth and his angels thrown down with him. Didn't we read that in, in Daniel 9 also? The host of heavens that he brought down. Who's controlling the Antichrist? Satan. Who's working through the false prophet? Satan. Who is the dragon? Satan himself. Now we've got three. We've got the dragon, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. What do we have? What do we have? A false trinity. Really mm -hmm. about it. A false trinity. What does Satan do? Does he ever come up with an original thought? No. Never. He counterfeits. What did he do here? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, I can do that. I've got myself, I've got my Antichrist, and I've got my false prophet, and here we go. And we're reading and seeing what the damage he's doing. So, the one who gives the power to this false prophet is none other than Satan himself. That's why he spoke as a dragon, because he is getting his authority and his control over others by Satan. Verse 12 fully says it. He exercises all the authority of the first beast, the one that comes out of the sea, the one we call the Antichrist, in his presence. So when he's in the presence of the Antichrist, he's got power and he's got authority. He is the Antichrist's right-hand man. He is carrying out the Antichrist's willful desires. He makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. When do we see that worship happen? mid-tribulation, the three and a half year point, Daniel 9, uh, Matthew 24, 15, how many places do I need to say? Well, we're reading here in Revelation, I think you get it. We all know when that abomination, which is an idol, is put in the temple, it makes the temple desolate because the Orthodox Jews will not come into the temple and worship a false god. They know thou shalt have no other gods before me, and they will literally spend the, their life's blood not bowing down to the Antichrist, who has now put his image in the temple to be worshipped, but look at who's forcing this control, this right-hand man. He's not getting his hands dirty. He's got his henchmen doing it for him. And this one makes the whole world to worship the first beast who they're worshiping because they had a fatal wound that was healed. Short, because we're not going through all the revelation. He, the Antichrist, is something happened to him that makes him look like he is dead. Maybe it's as close to beheading as you can get. I don't know. All I know is I do not believe it was an actual death because I believe the only one that can give life is the Lord, the Ruch Kodesh, Holy Spirit himself. I do not believe Satan has the power to give life. So this one 
had a fatal wound, should have killed him, looks like it kills him, the whole world thinks he's dead, and he's going to manage to be healed and be able to continue on. Does Satan have healing powers? Yes. We know it from history, we know it from the Bible, we do see it. Is he equal to God's powers of healing? No. But he does have power. So, he works this, quote, miracle. What's he faking? The death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah. Here's the death, burial, and resurrection of my man. We see the whole thing coming together here, what he is doing. And he deceives, um, well, then the 12 was, the fatal wound was healed. He performs, this is the false prophet, performs great signs. That's miracles. He has power to do miracles. Let me take you all the way back to Pharaoh. When Moshe was showing Pharaoh his power, he, Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's, what did they call him? Magicians. Magicians. We'll call them that. You know the word I mean. They could mimic a lot. When Moses threw down his his stick and it became a serpent, the others threw theirs down and they became serpents also. But Moshe's serpent ate their serpents. <laughs> See, God's is always stronger. God's is always better. But the false prophet will be able to do miracles. They're going to think that it's so great that he even makes fire come down out of heaven. Who did that? Oh, uh, what was it? Elijah. Elijah, who brought down fire out of heaven. Eliyahu, Elijah. So he's going to look to Israel like, wow, we've got a prophet like Eliyahu. And we're looking for Eliyahu to come. Hint. Remember this when we talk about the two witnesses. I'll be back. Okay? <laughs> Moving on here now. He makes fire coming down out of heaven in the presence of men, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth. Notice he's deceiving earth dwellers. <coughs> who are we as believers? Are we earth dowlers? Excellent, Rowena. I got A students in my class. <laughs> Citizens of heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are ambassadors on duty here on this earth. But this deception that's going on here on the earth dwellers is not when the believers are present. Does that mean there's no believers? No. People who got saved after the rapture are there. But they are having to suffer through the consequences of the tribulation because they are in it. We are not part of this. So, back on track. The, the, he deceives those who dwell on the earth. And the ones he's going to deceive are not the believers. Uh, because of the sign which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth, make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword. That's why I think he may be beheaded or looked to be. Um, who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Or so it appears. It was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That image that's put in the temple is going to look like it's alive. Whether it's done robotically, whether it's done with our computer systems, or whether it's done demonically with a demon entering into this stone, it's going to make it look like it's alive, and it's going to call out for the death of those who do not bow down and worship it. Remember Mordecai? Everybody else bowed down. He stood up. That's what's going to happen here. The believers that will not bow down will lose their lives, most of them probably, in martyrdom, because they did not go along with um, worshiping the beast. But who's pushing it? The false prophet. The beast is just sitting there taking it all in. Of course, he's doing other things too. Back to Daniel, Daniel 11, where we were. We are looking at the one called the willful beast here, or the willful king, I'm sorry. Out of, out of these verses, it was right there in the first phrase of verse 36, which I'm hurrying back to. The king will do as he pleases. He is a willful king. According to his will, he makes himself a dictator, now we see, so that he's above God. Worship me as God. Okay? So what does he do when he's expecting worship as God? He exalts and magnifies himself above every God. He is King God. He is God of gods. He is trying to take God the Father, Jehovah, however you want to put it, he's trying to take his place. And he will prosper until the indignation is finished. What does indignation mean? Do you remember from Revelation? 
Yeah, there's another word I want, though. Yeah, he's pouring out his wrath. Wrath, wrath and indignation are interchangeable. So he, this, this false prophet is going to prosper all the way until the wrath is finished. That means a false prophet is going to be alive and well all the way through the tribulation period. Um, for that which is decreed will be done. Another way of saying what we talked about earlier, what God has said will happen, happens. Okay? He will show no regard. Um, you know what? I forgot to tell you. When he speaks marvelous things, that's like monstrous. It's blasphemy. It's extraordinary. And it will reach a horrible climax. The, the filth and lies that will come out of his mouth will curl your hair will curdle milk, will, you know, I mean, th this is horrible. We know that Antichrist is the, the king of all blasphemies. Well, the false prophets just second right under in, in what they are spewing out of their mouth. Gross way to put it, but I see a sewer just pouring out. They open their mouth and I just see sewer. Ugh. Oh, and prospering means he's going to succeed until again the wrath is passed. Oh, let me give you, let me prove to you, indignation is the wrath of God. Another reason why I'm telling you, the tribulation is the wrath of God. We are not uh, appointed unto wrath. First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, and many other places deal with that repeatedly. That we as believers are not appointed to the wrath of God. This indignation is the wrath of God. This is falling on the earth dwellers, those who did not believe, those who missed the rapture because they did not believe, and unfortunately those who came later will still suffer consequences, came to faith later. Let me prove my point. Go to Isaiah 26, verses 20 and 21, and I want to give you a side note here. Also, I give you little shoots off because I'm trying to give you a whole picture. In Yeshaya, Isaiah 26 and verse 20, we pick up and it says, Come, my people. Now, let me get you into a Jewish mindset, okay? This is not a Christian mindset because there's no such thing as a Christian yet. There's no such thing as the church yet. We're mm -hmm. talking 700 B.C. Mm -hmm. This is before... The, the called out assembly that we call the bride of Christ today. So when it says, come my people, do not put into that, come Christians. That's not what we're saying. Who would be my people that Isaiah would be addressing? Jewish. Jewish. Bingo. Israel. Who's called the people of God? Israel. Now we know not all of Israel is Israel. Shaul Paul tells us that. Is the believing remnant. Well, who's going to be listening to God? The believers. Now, does that mean that Gentiles aren't in here? No, they are. Just like there are Jewish believers in, in the body of, of Christ in the church age today too. But this is being addressed the same way we saw Daniel. Daniel was addressed to his people and telling Israel what's going to be happening. Isaiah's talking to Israel. He's talking to the people of God called Israel at this time. He's telling them, come my people. Enter into your room, close room, sorry, close your doors behind you. Hide a little while until the indignation, same word, runs its course. Okay, I'm going to come back to that hide in just a moment. I want to read the next verse first. For behold, behold. are you awake? Are you paying attention? There's our behold. The Lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth. For their iniquity. The earth will reveal her bloodshed and will no longer cover her slain. Is that a picture of the tribulation? I think we all agree. There will be so many lying dead in the streets that can't even bury them as fast as they need to that are dying from the plagues and, and the wrath, the bowls, and all that is being poured out. Notice the Lord comes out of his place. He's coming out of heaven, pouring this indignation on the earth because the earth has filled, been filled with iniquity. Remember how it said when the cup of iniquity was full, then God would pour his wrath out. We see that that is what's happening here. So without a question, this is the tribulation period. That's loud and clear here. The bloodshed, everything is clear here. I don't think anyone would disagree with me. Now here's my side note. 
Again, if I go into the study completely, I have many more scriptures. I do not build a doctrine on one scripture. But let me ask you this. We know that this is correlating to the time also that we were just talking about, when that abomination is put in the temple and makes the temple go desolate. What makes a temple desolate? That means that they're not going to go worship in the temple anymore. Well, you go to worship right now. You go to worship the Lord our God in your place called a church. If someone put a statue to Satan at the top of that church, where your pulpit is, where your pastor usually stands, and said, you go to church, bow down before this, this image here, and you can have your service. How many of you would go? Not one of you. The believers would make that church desolate, empty. That's what it means. So this abomination has come into the temple, and even the Jews that are not believers in Yeshua, but are so intent on wanting to please God, they're just needing their eyes to be open to see that the way of God is through Yeshua. He said that himself. He called himself the way. They still know enough from the scriptures to know, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And through the Jewish history, many a time they have had their blood run in the streets because they would not bow down. The Crusaders, time of the Holocaust, many other times through history. So here we have a similar again. We have the temple becoming desolate. We know it's the middle of the tribulation, and they are being told in that first phrase, Come, my people, come those of you who have an ear to God and are hearing. Enter into your room, close your door behind you, hide for a little while. Now, what does that make you think of in Revelation? When we look at a time of hiding in Revelation, where and when, what are we talking about? Okay, very good. The middle of the tribulation, when that abomination is put in the temple, Matthew 24, 15, Yeshua Jesus speaking says, when you see that happen, flee. Get out of town and go fast. Pray it's not in the winter, because if it's snowing in Israel, it's hard to get around. Pray it's not on the Shabbat. I can tell you, in Shabbat, on my free time, trying to get around, no taxis, no buses, it's much harder. You use your feet, and that's a whole lot slower if you're being threatened for your life and you're running for your life. Pray you're not nursing. I've got a mama who's brand new nursing. If I told Lindsay, fire, get out, run, she's not going to be able to run like she could nine months ago. <laughs> she's going to be compromised. She's going to get out slower. She's going to have to take her baby. She's going to worry about that baby. That's what all these are saying. They're, they're warning them. It's going to be a horrible time. Pray it doesn't fall on any of those. Pray it's a time when you can get out and go fast. You need to go and you need to hide. And we believe God providentially is going to hide his people in Petra. We looked at that when we were there. I'm not here to fight for that right now, but here's my point. For every one of you who want to say, well, there might be a rapture mid-trip. We might have to go through up to this point. Then I want to ask you this question. If this is where the rapture is, why does God tell his believers to flee and hide? Why doesn't he say, look up, your redemption is here, and catch them up and take them home? Right. We don't see that here at all. We see him tell them to hide. Wait a little while till this indignation is finished, and then I am going to bring you out. That is to the believers in the tribulation period. It has nothing to do with the church. You don't hear it saying here, as it did to the seven churches, you know, if you have an ear, hear what God says to the churches. The one time that it uses that phrase, apart from that time when it's using it further, it leaves out the phrase to the churches. And it just says, he that has an ear, let him hear. This is just a side note. I'm not here to push and prove pre-trib. I don't ever push it. I just lay it out on the table. I will give you the scriptures for pre-trip, but here's where I take mid-trip, and I have asked mid-trip believers, what do you do with what I've just presented? Mm -hmm. I have never had one that can give me any answer that I can say to you, well, here's the counter. There just isn't a counter. They go away. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You've given me something to think about. 
Well, again, it's not me. It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Why does He give us this assurity? Because I think we need that. Because again, if they want to call it a crutch, I don't care. If you hurt your leg and you need a crutch, Amen. is it wrong to use a crutch? No. If you need to know that you're not going to go through a horrible time and they want to call that an excuse, they want to say, you're wimping out, well, I'm fine, I'm wimping out, I don't care. But my God told me I don't have to man up and get through the first half. I don't have to go through all of this that builds up to this point. Hallelujah, I don't have to watch a beloved temple of worship to God go awry. Hallelujah, I don't have to see what the Antichrist and the false prophet are doing throughout this world. I don't have to fight for my life in that first half because I'm going to stand for my God. And I'm going to stand for my Yeshua Jesus. And anybody who tells me I can't open my mouth, I'm going to lose my head if that happens. Amen. Because I'm not, with God's help, not me, but the Spirit of God in me, I will stand for my God. Now pray for me because Don's going to come after me. But again... Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. But he gives the grace. We've seen that for those who are martyred. They did nothing wrong. In fact, they are our prime example. I look at our martyrs and I think, wow, Lord God, let me be like them if you call me to that. Does God give you that grace ahead of time? No. No. Did any one of those martyrs say, oh, I want to be a martyr? No. No. But does God give dying grace? Yes. The very first martyr, Stephen's face is aglow as he's looking up into heaven and seeing the glory that's about to be his. He's not going, oh, ow, oh, like he would be. And it, worse than that, he'd be screaming out in pain because those rocks were not just little pebbles that hurt. These were boulders that were killing him. They were eking his life out of him. And while he's dying, he's not in agony crying out. He is full of the glory of God. So if anyone is called, to martyrdom on this side and it happens we know it we listen to it in the news all the time god does give that grace but when god gives us so clearly his roadmap and says i'm not pouring my wrath out on my bride i'm not i'm not taking you through half i'm not beating you up and then taking you home <laughs> then we get to say hallelujah. hallelujah and we get to rejoice. If I thought I had to go through half, I would not be looking forward to the return of the Lord. I'd be in fear and concern and it would take away my joy. It, the only blessed hope would be that, that, that there's an end in that tunnel, but it would not be the joy we're told to look forward to. We're told we're even going to get a crown if we're looking for the blessed hope of the return of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy it is mine when I can say, He's coming for me before this, before this wrath is poured out. And when people say, well, what about all the people before? That's not fair. No, all the people before suffered tribulation. We're suffering or can suffer tribulation. We've got martyrs in our age. It's not that God's favoring a time, but I think He'd have to come up with a reason why he chose the generation he chose to suffer that way when he didn't all the other believers before that. You know, I think Christians would be hard-pressed not to commit suicide at the start of the tribulation if they knew they were going to live through three and a half years of it. They'd want to get out of it, find a way to, to do it. I don't know. I'm getting off. I want to get back on track. But you get my point. And I, I say it because I hear so many around me that do one of two things. One is they live in fear. I hope we don't have to go through that. I'm, I'm worried, but I, I hope you're right. Well, again, it's not me. It's the Word of God. That's either their attitude or they cop the attitude. Oh, it'll all pan out. I don't need to worry about it. Ha, 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 ha. Well, hello. When you start living through those days, it's not going to all pan out. You're not, if, you, if you're here, you're not going to feel like, oh, well, it's only three and a half years, and it's, it, it's not too bad. Now, go read the Four Horsemen of Chapter 6. Oh, yeah. You have war, you have pestilence, you have um, death. Um, what's the, the fourth? There's another. I've lost one of them. Now and everybody's freaking out. Good point. Good point. How many are freaking out now? How many can't handle the pandemic? 
How many are, are, are fearful and, and in despair and, and depression? We as, as the leaders have been having to talk against this to our congregations, to our people. We've tried to encourage you all, keep in the Lord because here is your shalom, no matter what your circumstances. And this, this isn't, well, okay, I'll give you this as a birth pain. But I'll bet if we ask Lindsay what her pains felt like last night, what they felt like in the morning, <laughs> big difference, big difference. So, yes, did we have another birth thing? Are we a little bit closer to the tribulations beginning? I believe so. I absolutely believe so. And if you want to say it was one of the bigger birth things, well, we'll all find out. Depending on how fast we go home, we'll all find out. Chella? Yeah. We have a prayer line twice a day, and we be praying for him. But one day before he died, he said, thank you so much for the prayers. I appreciate it so much, but no more prayers. I'm ready. I will be fine for the good. But I don't know. We're fine. So now I'm ready to go with my Lord. Now I want you each other pray for one another so that you can go with him too. So that's a beautiful test. Because I'm not dying. Now I'm gonna really wow. live. Aren't you gonna wow. change residents? I love it. I love it. I love it. If you could not hear her or understand her because of her accent, let me just tell you. Chella, the one that we prayed for when we opened this up today, um, let us know that her brother went home to be with the Lord yesterday? A couple days ago? No, on Saturday. On Saturday. Okay, on Saturday. Um, we prayed for her and keep her in prayer because even though she's victorious in the Lord, there's a hole in her heart. And we understand that. And her husband is also failing in health severely. So please keep her in prayer. She's she's in a tough spot. We want to hold her up in prayer. But she said that twice a day they have a prayer line that was praying for her brother. And the day before he went home to be at the Lord, he told the prayer line, no more prayers for me. I'm ready to go home. I've fought the good fight. And I'm changing my address from here to heaven. I'm going to be living in a mansion. I'm not dying. I'm living more alive than I have been. I may be phrasing a little wrong here, not the exact words, but you get the idea. What an outstanding testimony he gave. And then he told them, you pray for each other now. Pray that you each will fight that good fight, that you each and all will know the Lord so that you can come home one day too. Hallelujah. Beautiful testimony. And only one who has the peace of God in their heart could face death in that kind of way. I have seen that repeatedly in my life. I saw the peace that my parents both went home in the midst of. Literally, 100% shalom that they went home in. We've seen this and heard this in many testimonies, not to take away from Chella's brother at all. My great aunt, very, very strong prayer warrior, May I be that in my little niece, new niece's life? Um, sorry. Um, she told her daughter in the last week, and she many times we thought she was going to leave this earth, and she researched. And she told her daughter, woke up one morning, told her daughter, she says, my bags are packed. Of course, they haven't packed any bags. But she said, I'm ready to go. And she said, I know I'm going home this time. And she did also, also gave testimony. I'm sure we could go around the room and many, many could give testimony. Uh, another one that I'm remembering as I'm opening my Bible back up, very, very dear, strong believer. His heart would race away. They'd rush him to the hospital, get the heart back in the right rhythm, and on he'd go again. And this time in particular, his wife came around the corner into the living room where he was sitting just in time to see and hear. He was looking at him. He was a glow. He was looking at him. And he says, oh, my God. And he was gone. He was gone. She said she could feel the presence of angels in their home, just filled the place. She said, I should be sad. I should be crying. She says, I can't. I'm rejoicing. <laughs> because 
God had taken her loved one in such a beautiful way. Is he faithful? Yes. If it's in the moment with a gun in front of you, I give you Rachel Scott, 16 years of age, just rededicated her life a few months before, was strong in the Lord because of those last few months. And when she was asked, do you believe in Jesus? And she knew my answer, yes, would mean my death. She said it anyway. She said yes and instantly was ushered into the presence of the Lord. How does a 16-year-old kid stand up against a gun? That's scary. She didn't exhibit fear. She exhibited the power of the Lord. Whatever we have to face, our God is greater. He's greater than anything Satan can throw at us. We need not worry. Corey Tim Boom, Papa, I'm so worried. I'm worried about the, the Nazis. And he said, Corey, when we go to go on the train, when do I give you your ticket? Do I give you your ticket here at home? No, Papa. Do I give you your ticket en route to the train station? No, Papa. Do I give you your ticket at the start of the train station? No, Papa. You give me my ticket the minute I'm stepping on the train. And he said, that's when God will give you the grace to face the Nazis. If you're called to it, it'll be the minute you're called to it. You don't need to worry. And Corey lived her life in the concentration camps proving that to be true. She had battles, she, she was up and down. Her sister was the stronger believer and helped her a lot. But Corey came out with a testimony that could not be silenced. She came out and did much work for the Lord afterwards and she was let out on a fluke. She should not have been let out. That God said, Corey, it's not time for you to die and it's not slated for you to die in the concentration camp. And I, I love that family, I love their testimony, I love the fact they hid my people and I know there's at least one Jewish man that hid in their room that came to Messiah because of their family. I'm sure many more, but one on record. Hallelujah. We're off track. We've got five minutes. Oh, they ask for forgiveness? Yes, yes. With Corey, the, the Rogers reminded me. Um, she, her, her sister Betsy that I just referred to died in the concentration camp. She was beaten severely by one of the guards and died in Corey's arms. This ripped Corey's heart out. I mean, Shell's heart's ripped out and her brother didn't go home in such circumstances. I can't even imagine living through that. And years later when Corey was speaking and speaking on forgiveness and speaking on being, she called herself a tramp for the Lord. And that's the name of one of her books. She had just finished speaking about how we have to, to forgive, that, that that's what God calls us to do, not to hold against others, but to be to forgive. And as she had finished, before she stepped down, she saw coming up the middle aisle the very Nazi soldier that had killed her sister. He had tears rolling down his face, and he came up and put out his hand. He wanted her forgiveness. He asked her for her forgiveness. And she said that in a moment, she was as rigid as could be. She could not put out her hand to this man who had beat her sister to death. How could she forgive him? How could she extend that kind of mercy to him? How could she forgive him? She had not forgiven him in her heart. And yet, as she was rigid in those split seconds, and if you've ever been in an accident, you know how the seconds spread in those split seconds she knew everything she had just said everything she had been teaching others was absolutely worthless if she couldn't live it and do what she was saying we need to watch what we say because god does call us to do what we say not just hearers but doers and she knew she could not do it and she simply sent up a prayer and she said it was as if something just flooded her from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet. And that rigidity was gone and she found herself reaching out and even embraced the Nazi who had killed her sister. That's the power of the living God in us. That's the root of the Kodesh. That's not human. That's divine. That's That's amazing. We're at a point that I think, rather than go on, I'm going to tell you what's coming. Um, we have kind of taken little side trips, but I hope that they have spoken to you. I feel like they're, they have validity. 
So we are a little longer on Antichrist than I expected, but again, I'm not here for it. We gotta be done at a certain point, so just bear with me. We'll continue in Daniel 11 next week. We'll look at what it means. I'll get your question in just one moment, Ruth. I do see your hand, so I'll come right to you in a moment. We're going to look at what it means that he doesn't, um, oh, how's it put it? Doesn't respect the gods of his fathers. There's a lot of controversy out on that. What's that meaning? Does that mean that he is Jewish? Because there are people who take it and say the God of the fathers is Elohim. What does the Hebrew say here? How do we get an answer to that? What's it mean when he doesn't care about the desire of women? We're going to go through those meanings. We're going to just find out what it means that he's a God of fortresses. There's a lot here in Daniel 11. And we're going to come to a very important question of the news today. There is a huge thrust for the division of the land of Israel. Will that happen? Does scripture talk about it? I will answer that question next week. I hope that makes you want to come back. So uh, but what a note to end on, the power of our holy God. And I, I love and I'm reminded where I opened up in scripture today, his plan is what is carried out. It's not caught off guard. It's not plot, plan B. It's not stopped except by God's hand when he starts and he stops. And we know that what he has planned is what will happen. Because of that, I know that I know that I know that I have the Lord in my heart. And when I leave this earth, nothing will separate me from the love of my God in heaven with him forever. If he could turn his back on what he says to the Jews, if he could be unfaithful here, he could be unfaithful there. There's not one hair on my head that's standing up in fear. My God is faithful. My God is true. And what my God says, take it. Sign your name on it. Wrap yourself up in it and live your life according to it. You will not be disappointed. Look to man, he'll let you down every time, no matter how good they are, no matter how much they care, no matter anything. But look to God. Be secure and know, even when we study these end events and see, no fear, no worry, our God is in control. And he's got a plan, and we get to go home. Ruth, let me get you to unmute your mic. You're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. I just came across a passage in Scripture that really talked to me during this this whole Bible study. It comes from 2 Timothy 1 at verse 7. It says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. And that really spoke to me. And I thought, why did I come across this? I don't know. But it is in relationship to sometimes the fear that we feel of what we're going through, the pandemic, the fear of uh, the, of the end times. It's It really spoke to me. And I thought maybe it might speak to somebody else. Beautiful. It's, thank you for bringing it in. I'm sure it has spoken to many hearts. And it is ideal. He's given us... The sound mind, no fear, no worries. I love Corey Ten Boom again, you know, that God throws our sins into the deepest of seas, and then he puts up the sign that says no fishing. Well, you can throw all your worries there too, because perfect love casts out all fear. And he tells us, cast all our care on him, for he cares for us. So yes, excellent words in a pandemic, in an uncertainty, I don't know who I'm talking to who either is themselves or their family members or friends could be dealing with loss of job. You know, their 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 it, retirement income has now disappeared. They're older than what's going to be naturally hired. They don't know how they're going to put food on the table as they continue to age. There could be a lot of fear, but my God knows your needs. And he says, seek me first and all these things will be added to you. So excellent point to end on thank you ruth glad you shared it the whole word of god that's why i go off into other sections and bring it in it's the whole word of god we want to see it all we want to see how it interrelates we want to bring it all together so an excellent verse to tie into our study today thank you again um, any other comments or questions before we close in prayer
We will open it up for, um, I'm looking at both my Zoom family and my house family. <laughs> Prayer request? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, is what? Getting closer. Okay. Gina's on Zoom and uh, wasn't in in time to bring in. We prayed for her with her court situation, but she's applied for a job and they're, it's, you know, coming down to where it looks like the door may be opening. So we will pray that if this is of the Lord, that that door open all the way. Naomi, did I remember to pray for your prayer request or did I get sidetracked? You're, you're muted. You're muted. I prayed for Kayla. I don't think I prayed for the other situation, did I? She's still muted. Can you help her? Sorry, hang on one second, but I think I owe you. I don't know how I managed to do that. I put a list in front of me, and I still derail. Okay. Okay, you prayed for Kayla, but not the other, you know, the Lord knows. Well, I'm going to now. So, let's go to prayer before Rochelle forgets. <laughs> Lord God, thank you. You have spoken to us of your awesomeness, your might, and your power. You've reminded us that you're in control and that you have worked out a phenomenal plan that man could not have derived on his own and could not force to have happen, but he also cannot keep it from happening. I laugh, Lord God, when I think that man thinks he is leading and he is just simply falling into your hands of what you have preordained. Thank you for the security and the hope and the safety that that gives us. Thank you for the assurance that we are home with you, not suffering indignation and wrath, but home safe with you. Yet, Lord, while we are still here, may it fill us with your peace that we not be living in fear and are better to be active and doing what you've called us to do. Lord, you've given Naomi a, a great task here in speaking to these, to bring truth to them, to remind them that we have to stand with Scripture and what Scripture says. We have to call out sin. We have to call sin what is sin. That it does not mean that they cannot love their child who has gone into homosexuality. That they cannot condone and tell others that that sin is okay with God. Because we know with you no sin is okay. And Lord, forgive us for even making some sins bigger and some sins smaller. Because you don't do that either. Any sin keeps us from your presence except through the shed blood of our Messiah and Savior, how we thank you for his blood and his eternal work. But as Naomi goes to speak for you now, Lord, fill her up. May she just open her mouth and the words that flow out be the very words that you know these ears need to hear to bring them into a right place with you, that they can even be tools used by you to help reach not just their, their child, but others who are in this also. Lord, this world is getting so sin-soaked. It is calling good bad and bad good. It is trying to write the evils and say that everything is okay. Lord, let us take a stand where we need to, to, to speak for you, to not condone, to not blink, to not just look away, but to really take a stand that will stand out for you. Fill us with that, um, that, uh, that, that spirit that is a fear. I can't think of it. Fill us with that strength to be able to take that stand. And I'm reminded, Lord, that you told Shaul Paul, a great speaker, a great testimonial to you, that you told him when he'd stand before kings and magistrates not to even premeditate what he would say and not to fear that you would fill his mouth. So give Naomi that same boldness and that same sense of your presence. Use her and may what she sees as a battle fall by the wayside as you just clip their wings for the, their defenses that are against what you give us in the word of God. Lord, thank you for your word that is sure and true, that does give us a standard. And may we, to the best of our ability, through the power of the Spirit in us, live in accordance with those rules and regulations, not that we are condemned by them now, because in your shed son's blood we are not condemned. But, Lord, that does not give us the freedom to do whatever we want. And may we remember that. Remember we belong to you. Remember we are reflections of you, that we are ambassadors here just passing through to be a testimony for you. Lord, enable us all. May we be like Corey Tim Boom. May we be like Chella's brother. May we be like others that we've spoken about today. May we shine for you even in the midst of horrific circumstances. But Lord, in the good times too, let us not forget you and let us show to the world 
a total different perspective than what they have that would draw them in because, Lord, in these last moments, we want to bring our loved ones that are with them, our friends that are with them, those within our voice. We want them to join us, Lord, that they could go home with us too. So please work your mighty hand in their lives and may they yield their will to yours. Thank you now. We trust it all to you. Oh, and Lord, help Gina with this job also. If this is the right one for her, give her such favor that they will hire her with no, no qualms, no ifs, ands, or wars about it. They'll just know that she is the one they want. If she is not to work here, Lord, for a reason that you know beyond us, give her peace when that door closes, and please close it tight and open the right door to her. That if this is it, may it happen sooner rather than later, and may she just be strong in you, knowing the decisions in your hands, not the management, and surely not she herself, but in your hands. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord, for the safety and the security that we find being in your hand, and your hand is in the Father's hand. Hallelujah. Oh, how we praise you, how you are ineffable, and how we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. Praise the Lord. Thank you. It's been a blessing. I love having you all here. Want to come next week? <laughs> I miss you all. Love you all too. Um, open mics, and you can speak if you want attention in the room. Let me know. I'll get you attention in the room. You can speak to each other. You all can come speak to somebody on Zoom. Oh, okay. I know what it is. It's here. But thank you. Um, are you panning around? Are you showing yep. them? On this one. On thank you. Oh. And then we'll do this one too. Praise the Lord. He is faithful. He is awesome. I'm not moving according to my schedule. According to his. I hope that's good with you too. I mean, I'll work as well. Any who are going to shalom. I'm sorry, Naomi. Thank you for a very good lesson. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. He gets all the glory. It's our God.